And uh, I am really excited about our discussion today, which we've titled Reinventing the Senior Center. And uh, we are we have two individuals who are involved in a very innovative project. Um, Jeff Dreyfus, who's principal with Bushman Dreyfus Architects, and Peter Thompson, who is the executive director at the Center at Belvedere, which is this innovative center that is in um, Charlottesville, Virginia. And I'd love to welcome uh, Peter and Jeff to the stage. And let's first, before we dive into all the interesting and amazing things that you've done with this project, let's get to know the two of you a little bit better. Let me uh, start with you, Jeff. Um, you're involved with the design of this uh, center. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background le leading up to uh, being involved in this project. Whoops. Oh, unmute. You think after all this time, I'd be used to that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Steve. I, my name is Jeff Dreyfus. Our architectural firm is Bushman Dreyfus Architects. We're located in Charlottesville, Virginia. We've been in business for 30 years. Most of our projects over that course of time have been community-oriented nonprofit projects. I will say that this was our first senior center. We had not done a project like that before. And I'll get into some of the, the background of, of how it worked uh, from our, our firm's perspective and from the client's perspective. But that's, that's a little bit of background. I love it. And, and Peter, I... Uh... Right before we jumped on, you shared a little bit of information about your background that I had no idea, but a lot of people in our audience I know know your sister, uh, Kelly Thompson, who is a renowned elder law attorney in the DC metro area. Um, but tell us a little bit about your background and what led to you up to this point in your career. And thank you, Steve. Thanks for the invitation to present our story. And thanks, Jeff, for, for joining us today in your busy life and, and all the success you had in helping this. Yeah, my big sister's Kelly Thompson. A lot of people do know that. Her last name's not that um, unfamiliar, so people don't always connect the dots. But yes, Kelly's been a, a great um, elder law attorney and servant to the Alzheimer's Association Board and Hospice Board in Northern Virginia and continues to practice up there. So if you need a good special needs or elder law attorney, Kelly's one of the best. Um, my uh, other background, in addition to being Kelly's baby brother, is I've been 22 years here as the executive director here at the center, also known as the Center of Belvedere. Um, and at the national level, I've uh, been involved in the National Institute of Senior Center, part of the National Council on Aging. I'm on the leadership council here today uh, and was on the delegate council years ago. <clears throat> Actually led a research project about 12 years ago and then co-authored a uh, article in the Journal of Applied Gerontology uh, about new models of senior centers back before we actually really were very far along in envisioning our senior center. Um, and the center is a four-time accredited center, and I also then serve as an accreditation peer reviewer and standards trainer, among many other things on the local level, but that's very specific to uh, uh, the senior center field and part of how I have learned and part of how I give back. I, I love it. All right. Well, Let's just jump into um, uh, the discussion now, and I know you 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 both have some visuals to share, which I think is amazing because we want to glimpse at some of the things that are different here. But I think as we talked about this, you're going to help us understand the journey that you know just because you sort of dream something, it definitely doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of politics and you know, a lot of nego negotiation and, 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 you know, design and approvals and things of that nature to create something that is innovative. And I also want to say to the audience is, is that I know I, don't, I, I, I remind the audience of this is, is that you might not be in the senior center business, but when we hear these stories, they should be inspiration for how you can reinvent whatever it is you're doing in our in our field. Because one thing's for sure is I think that a lot of us, when we look at the landscape of what is being provided in elder care, I oftentimes hear us in the business saying, yeah, I'm not so sure I'd want to move there. I'm not sure I'd want to go there. 
you know, I mean, I've heard senior center direction directors over the years saying, you know, oh, I love my center, but yeah, no, I wouldn't go here when I'm 55, you know, or something like that. So uh, I just say that as a reminder. I also, the other reminder is we want you to ask questions. We want you to engage. So use that Q&A box. We'll get to them before this is over. So I'm going to uh, duck behind the curtain here and let you two uh, carry on, but feel free to shout my name out if you've got a question or if you want me to um, uh, assist. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. And I think I'm going to start a little bit about the kind of journey because uh, before we invited Jeff to the table, um, the center was was looking, starting this journey. Um, and we could fill hours just talking about the process uh, of getting to even Jeff, much less than the design process. But we certainly, we kind of look at it of, of the, the journey of what it took to get to the design process, some more of the design process, and then what the differences are at the center. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not a big secret uh, to this audience, I wouldn't think, to, I'm just going to share screen here on, uh, to show a little bit here. Um, you know, we all know about the aging demographics uh, being remarkable, but just to show here in the Shaw to Loudmoral area, I'm sure a lot of our audience knows the, the community, but it just shows very quickly um, how Shaw to Loudmoral has a particularly acute uh, growing from you know 24,000 to over 42,000 today um, and looking to over double basically in a generation gives people a kind of sense of uh, what the uh, demographics are just here in the Charlottesville Almoral area that are very dramatic. Um, and you know our center has been around since 1960. We're a nonprofit. We're not governmental. Um, we have grown and moved multiple times um, over the years in various lease spaces before we built our own first standalone senior center designed to be a senior center that opened in 1991. And about 12 to 15 years later, I started in uh, 1999 as the director. Uh, we were starting to realize that the center that seemed to be so state-of-the-art in 1991, already by 2002, 2005, was, uh, uh, was being uh, clear that it was not going to meet the needs of the community for generations to come. And specifically, some of the things we looked at um, were we really didn't have any fitness spaces. We did dance programs, but they were done on a linoleum floor on a concrete slab. And I can literally remember one of the first days where I realized what our problems were, where I'd say, Jeff, I don't see you at tap dance or Tai Chi or the primetime fitness anymore. And, you know, it's my back, my knees, my hip won't allow me to exercise on your concrete floor. Um, so fitness spaces were, were missing entirely. We had no performing arts spaces and we were growing to having two or three bands and a drama group and singing groups. And we didn't have a proper space for that with acoustics or stage or anything like that. Um, we only had one proper lifelong learning space. We had a great little classroom for about 20 people. But as soon as you went to a program for 25, it went to the great big cafetorium on that concrete floor with a high ceiling and our 60 piece band playing next door. Um, so we didn't really have good lifelong learning spaces. Um, the former center had no outdoor spaces to speak of. It had a small rose garden, but it was right, right on a major thoroughfare road that you know you didn't want to sit out there and enjoy a cup of tea or a book of poetry or a rose garden poetry party. So it basically really was no outdoor spaces. Uh, it had virtually no kind of just general social spaces. We were very much a center that people came for a program, but then you kind of had to leave because there's no place to hang out and talk to your friends or have a cup of coffee or tea or anything like that. Um, indoors or outdoors. Um, we had a very poor small art studio space. Uh, we had no space to hang or very poor space to hang our visual arts so it didn't celebrate the visual art programming. Uh, we And we simply were running out of space. We literally were, when we were growing, we were putting staff in former closets. That got to be a problem because then we didn't have storage space because we were running out of closets. Um, we didn't have enough parking. Um, just the sheer amount of space was inadequate. Uh, and frankly, uh, we almost showed some pictures, but decided not to spend time on this. The building was designed very much by our Depression era GI generation seniors. It was a very institutional, frugal box. It looked like an office building. Um, and that met the needs of a generation, but it was not going to meet the needs of my generation. Um, I'm 62. And we were hearing that from people. It's like, I wouldn't, you know, it's just, it feels like an institutional box. It's not a nice place for me to kind of go and hang out. 
So those are some of the, the low lights of our former center that showed that we needed something really significantly larger and really radically different to meet the needs of our community. And so then about 2005, we had a board member, Bill Hodson, um, who pointed all this out and, and really drove us to really looking at it, reviewing the demographics uh, and a whole lot more that really showed the center was not meeting the needs of the community going forward. And for about a year, we actually looked at expanding on site until we sat at my office table one day and laughed and said, we're not thinking big enough. We're gonna spend a fortune to get marginal increases and be very disruptive during construction. Um, so that's kind of a really quick snapshot of about 10 years of kind of where the center realized where we needed to do something different. Um, Jeff and you know, kind of you, your perspective on that for when we uh, approached you um, very early in the process because Jeff and his firm helped us uh, evaluate sites. Um, so what you, you want to tag all, along with some of that kind of what the, that early stages of the process was? Sure. Uh, again, it was not yet having expanded our thinking, and I'll say our because it really did, it, we were a team, as to how, how broad we should be thinking. We looked very early on at renovating, buying, renovating, and perhaps expanding an existing facility, a, a health club. I think the thinking at the time was that the center was not going to be able to afford much. So what was the most we could imagine? So we studied a couple of actual buildings for ways to renovate them. Cost seemingly came in high, higher than anybody had first imagined. And then we started looking at sites, open sites. And uh, I believe over the course of time, the center studied 30 different sites in the Charlottesville Albemarle area, trying to understand proximity for services, uh, location to the, the current members, and also how the center could serve the widest audience possible. So some very broad stroke studies on about three sites as we began to narrow it down so that once, once the process was ended and we had focused on the current site that was purchased, everyone understood and knew that the, the best choice was being made based on the parameters of everything else that we had studied. Um, during that time, we began some programming, some very early preliminary programming when we were just looking at buildings, uh, I'm sorry, existing buildings. But not too long into that process, the center understood that we really, really needed to start to get serious about programming. Peter, you might then touch upon the formal process that the center undertook in hiring the, the design team. Yeah, I think, um, thanks for that perspective. Uh, yeah, we, we found a building that we thought was turnkey and about a year later we realized we're gonna have to scrape it and start from scratch. <laughs> so that was a, a good lesson. And, um, you know, the center, as I mentioned, we have been very involved in the national level. Um, and we had a great board president 20 years ago, who Mary Reese, who told me, it's like, you, you know, your job is to, but we were in very dire financial straits. And I'm like, we can't send me to a conference. We don't have enough money. And she grabbed my hand one day. She goes, we can't afford not to have you go to the national conference. And it was just a you know 180 view of, of differently looking at a problem. And it really helped connect the center more in accreditation, being the standard reviewer, got me into the new models, research um, and helped me learn more about what how the senior center field was advancing and passing us by um, and and learned uh, from some of the best um, and one of the benefits of that was meeting uh, our friends at lifespan design studio uh, uh, Doug and Ellen Gallo who I'm sure some of the folks here know which is a boutique architectural firm specializing in senior center design, both from the ground up and renovating buildings. Um, they do work all over the country based out of Ohio. Uh, Ellen is a former senior center director. Doug is an architect. They're a great team. And we were really excited about their expertise. In fact, they actually helped us look at our former center to help us realize that uh, trying to renovate that was not really a good bang for the buck. Um, and so that was one of the early stages was like, you know, what, whatever, if we ever get to do a center, I wanted to work with Doug and Ellen Gallo. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, we had a board member who very early on, uh, I won't go into all of it, connected us with an owner's representative, uh, Mike Matthews, Matthews Development Company, a private developer, also a small boutique firm. Um, and part of what he does, in addition to doing his own 
development work is he hires himself out to a nonprofit like us to represent our interests in everything it takes to develop a property. Because we don't have that skill set in our center. Um, and it made no sense for us to develop it because we're just going to do it once in a generation. So having somebody from the outside come in, help us think about the regulatory issues. He negotiated the price purchase for our property, saved us a half million dollars right there, more than paid for his fee, um, and helped us think about how to create the, 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 the design process. Um, and one of the things Mike really helped us with was doing a, a, you know, getting our architect and our contractor together at the same time, not designing it and finding a general contractor, but getting those two people to the table at the same time. We had already engaged Bushman Dreyfus. I knew Jeff from some other community work from both our previous lifetimes ago. Um, and I knew he did good work and we were very excited about the fact that he had worked with nonprofits and understood that we had a lot of stakeholder input and not, you know, I'm not a single decision maker. <laughs> um, we have a lot of people that have to have input in a, a senior community center and a nonprofit. Um, uh, so we got Mike Matthews, our owner's rep, we signed a contract with him to represent our interests. Um, he helped us firm up our relationship with Bushman Dreyfus. Um, Jeff understood that we were going to engage lifespan, uh, which was important. Architects are artists and artists don't always want to create with others. They wanna create their beauty. Um, and I give Jeff and his team a lot of credit for, for working with another architect firm and the Gallows for playing well in the sandbox uh, as well. Um, and so that was an important consideration. Um, so those were kind of the first couple of pieces of what the center really did of getting owner's rep, contractor, uh, Bushman Dreyfus and lifespan at the table. And then Jeff, maybe you can talk more about some of the next steps of building the, the design team since you really coordinated more of those next steps. Well, we, as, we, as we moved further, it was clear that the, the core team was going to be lifespan design, the center, volunteers, board members, other community members, our architecture firm. And then we, we brought on a variety of other consultants as needed. An important one, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, we all know, structural, we all know, but we, we also included an acoustic consultant as well as a lighting consultant for the project uh, because of the, the needs that we were going to have to address. I already saw that in the Q&A, there's a question about materials because acoustics are so important. So from the start, the team included those specialists. I will say the gallows were incredible to work with. Um, it really was a team effort. Their experience informed everything, every question we asked and everything that we then proposed to the center. We'll also say that one of the key components to the team was a design committee that the center created so that we, uh, the, the design team, had a, a group of people to whom we answered. And Peter was part of that committee, but Peter was not the final decision maker. So that when, when the project was when the design was complete before we began construction, there was buy-in from every aspect of the center's constituency because they were represented on this design committee. Um, beyond that, I think that it was the, the usual design, build, construction process with our contractor on board. And I can't say enough about the value of having a contractor on board very early in the process, pre-selecting a contractor. There are ways that you can guarantee or ensure that you're getting good pricing, even though they've been pre-selected, but they provided invaluable information every step of the way to keep us on track budget-wise and schedule-wise. And every time we hit a hurdle, they were a part of finding the solution. So um, as part of the team, it, I, I truly believe the contractor is, is a crucial part of that, that stool, the third leg of the stool. Um, Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, and I think a couple other pieces that reminds me of, I mean, the whole design team having a lot of stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, was critical. We did create a, a design, uh, excuse me, a decision-making policy internally for the center of when, you know, when it was a group decision, when it, you know, was group input, and ultimately I would have to make a decision because um, it is hard to, you know, decide <laughs> 10,000 decisions um, for something like this. And then we also, as we got further along, had a lot of where, 
Jeff could make decisions and a lot where Mike Matthews, our owner's representative, could make decisions. There were certain things, you know, up to certain dollar figures that he was authorized to make decisions and not bother me with. That was his expertise. Um, one of the things we promised to Jeff and do Barton Mallow, our general contractor, which is a, a national firm um, that has a big office in Charlottesville, has done a lot of work at UVA, including JPJ for UVA basketball fans. Um, uh, uh, Jeff and uh, and Mike, um, you know, had a lot of uh, abilities to make decisions because we we trusted them. They had the expertise to be able to do that. And one of the things we promised them, I said, you know, we have some political oomph when we needed that. Um, I, there, I had connections in the city and county if we needed certain things done, and we only had got Mike only twice called me to ask for that. Um, and I said, we will promise to stay out of your way best we can, and we will promise to make decisions quickly when we need to. And once they were really in building, that was a big part we did. Mike made a lot of decisions with Jeff and Barton Mallow. So that was important. Um, and I, for anybody who has any questions or wants documents of this, I can share things. Um, you'll have my email at the end of this. I'm happy to share what we did. And the other was we had criteria every step of the way. We had criteria in picking our contractor. We had criteria in picking our architect. We had criteria around design, around environmental friendly, about affordability, um, about being age friendly, but age less, about looking for a 50 year building. We weren't gonna be on the cheap in this. All that was written down and it helped sometimes when push came to shove to go back and say, here's our, in fact, at board meetings when we knew we were gonna face some challenges, like here's the criteria again, this is why we're asking you for an additional dollar or whatnot. Um, so I think those were two important process steps as well that I neglected to mention. Maybe it'd be helpful to, to jump in and just give an overview of the center itself. I, I think so, because uh, Steve, at least looking a little bit at the Q&A and some of the chats, it looks like a lot of them um, are kind of more into the next steps about the key differences and whatnot. So maybe we absolutely. Can... Yeah. And getting sort of a sample of what this center looks like, but great background and just really illustrating that, you know, all the all the levers that you got to pull to to make something a reality. Um, and I'm glad, uh, Jeff, you did address Bonnie O'Leary's uh, question about what flooring do you use and how do you handle acoustics, which are so difficult for people with hearing loss. New centers have way too much echo from the high ceilings and other factors. Yeah, we'll probably try to touch upon some of those issues. We, we tried to deal with uh, vision issues, audio issues, uh, sensory issues that that aren't necessarily thought of that, that again, Ellen Gallo brought to the table, how much pattern can somebody stand to, to look at without starting to feel dizzy? So perhaps what, what I'll do is we have a, a video that describes the, the project overall, and maybe I'll start that and Peter and I will talk a little bit. It gives an overview of the facility and I think with that, we'll be able to share a bit more. Let me get myself set up here. Here we go. Um, okay. And one second, if I can learn, figure out how to start this. Uh, right down there on the right. There. All right. Peter, you may want to talk a little bit about uh, the very first part of this does have to do with location and and. Yeah, I mean, it was really important for us to find that. It was very uh, hard in Charlottesville, Alabama to find an affordable place. That red dot in the middle is downtown Charlottesville. You can see that's we're about two and a half miles from the downtown mall, three miles from UVA, only about a mile and a half from our former center. That was important to people who felt we were moving way out of town. Um, and we use this video a lot to help people Ill, uh, in our fundraising, because there were some people who felt we were moving way out of town and in this different part of the area. Um, and it helps show that we we didn't. Um, and this is a Google map kind of zooming in um, to the northern uh, portion of uh, Charlottesville Almoral. If people know Charlottesville Almoral, Rio Road, Fashion Square Mall, um, we're just uh, between that and heading to the downtown mall in a neighborhood called Belvedere. Belvedere Boulevard takes you right. We're in this first property here uh, that you would uh, 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 approach going before you go into the Belvedere neighborhood so you don't have to deal with the neighborhood traffic or the first thing you get to and that was an important consideration to be easily accessible and I believe this does just keep going Jeff right yep it does yeah. 
So uh, you'll see there's a covered entry and you'll see more visions of that. Parking is important, 235 spaces. Big lawn space, which will be in phase two eventually. You see a garden building, an event lawn. You'll see more of this in a bit. Gardens, the outdoor spaces were very important as we talked about. And rooftop solar, which we often uh, forget to mention. About half our power comes from solar energy on the roof of the center. So these are clearly designed. You'll see how it ends up being very similar, uh, almost identical once you see the actual pictures. But it gives you a good overview because we don't have a good drone overview of the current building. This helps give you a perspective of the site and the and the property. Jeff, you want to pick it up from there? Sure. Uh, porches on both sides, porches to welcome you as you come from the, the parking area, but also a porch on the, the rear overlooking a, a stormwater pond that we took advantage of as, as part of the landscape. Quick overview of the layout of the building. Um, the, the very center of the building, we call the atrium. It's the hub of the building. And the organization is really quite simple. Guests arrive here, the check-in desk is here, and then orientation to the rest of the building is really quite straightforward with the performing arts area here, fitness here. We have a coffee shop here. We also have a travel center here. And then the main stair that takes you to the second floor along with a bank of elevators. Also here in the bottom right, Peter may touch upon our community partner it was a, a health clinic um, that was a, a critical part of making this happen. So as we look at the first floor, the entry, the atrium, so that this is where people are immediately oriented to the rest of the building. The staircase is designed to be age friendly with low rise and, and deep treads, two handrails, one for taller people, one for less tall people. You can see here the welcome desk and the travel center and space, spaces for socialization. A coffee shop, uh, Peter should talk about this a little bit in terms of the business model. Greenberry's Coffee is a franchise that the center actually owns and runs. Uh, having good food available was a critical element to the program. We have fitness room, the fitness wing. We have both group exercise as well as individual fitness rooms. Here you can see that the fitness room with views to the outdoors. And, and I'll say, we'll touch upon this more in a bit, but views, connections to the outdoors, I think are one of the most important and probably one of the trademark elements of the center at Belvedere. Um, so that you never feel as though you're closed into a building. You are always having a connection visually with the outdoors and daylight. Um, this is one of the group exercise rooms. The auditorium, a very important element, not just for the center, but also for the center to be able to offer it to the community. And this has become, I believe, a revenue generator for the center. The city of Charlottesville, the area does not have a performance facility that is either acoustically good or able to seat enough people. So this has already become a, a popular element. On the second floor, again, two wings. We have the, the, the atrium to the right here. We see the lifelong learning center and the library, the art room. And then to the left, we have a game room and then a number of conference rooms there in blue, plus the yellow are the, the offices for the center's staff. And we can see here the services in gray. So the building is really pretty simply organized. And that's been one of, that was one of the key design components. Or one of our real goals was that directions were as simple as go down the hall and it's on your right, not over the river, through the woods, and then you, you find the, the building, the, the room that you're looking for. Social spaces throughout the building, generously proportioned and places for people to sit, have conversations. Also, this whole wing here is a place where we can display the artwork. There's the art studio there on the right. We're walking into the lifelong learning wing right now, but you can see that, that the art program and art display was a critical component of the project. And then places along the way for people to stop, have a conversation, something casual, something formal if necessary. And these are all of the straight ahead is the library with again, views to the outdoors. Uh, that is the quick overview of the design. Um, 
I think that I can stop that. Peter, you may have a few images to share. Yeah, let me let me then show um, some. Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate Hold on. you remembering that we had that. Um, so, whoops, let me uh, get my screen share here. Share screen uh, from current slide from current slide, there you go. So this again is, we're gonna start kind of outside a little bit to get perspective. It also just shows you a little bit of the, uh, one of the key designs of, of having a more contemporary design in the former building and a lot of glass. You'll see that throughout the building um, to bring natural light in and have beautiful vistas. One of the things we loved about the property is it has really very nice vistas outside of everywhere. So that again, gives you a sense of the site and the footprint uh, before we started building. Uh, early construction views, but it also gives you a sense of the of the lay of the land. Building pretty well accomplished on the outdoors, and they're starting to work indoors. We have thousands of these, but we won't do too many of those. We just did the floor plans. I'll skip those. We did do a lot of construction hard hat tours for people have to raise money and raise energy. Um, I can't say enough about how powerful they were and how awesome Barton Mallow was to allow us to traipse through there sometimes twice a day, five days a week. Um, that's the finished product uh, just before opening. Uh, you can see the solar panels, you can see the backyard, um, the grass turf in the bottom right is all um, seeded and growing. The wildflowers in the middle uh, bottom have not started growing up yet um, at that time. That is a, a drone picture from very just before we open. That's what you see when you approach um, those louvers, the horizontal uh, wood pieces, the slats at the entry. Um, thank God Jeff Dreyfus con convinced us to do those. Mike Matthews, our architect, thought they weren't gonna be worth it. He talked us out of spending the $80,000 just before we built. Um, we felt we had a little bit of, we felt a little richer and Jeff convinced us to put them in. And Mike, uh, even Mike said, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was wrong about that one. Um, they really help frame the space. It gives us some more appeal and it creates an outdoor living room space there. You can see some cafe tables that you'll see a little bit more uh, there under it, which was a really, really critical piece. It's not only welcoming, it becomes an outdoor living room space. Boy, did we have no idea how important that was gonna be over the last two years. On the bottom right, you see the entry to the Centera Family Medicine Clinic. It's not a geriatric clinic, they're geriatric specialists, but it is a family medicine clinic. That's a full market rate lease space, uh, which helps generate some important revenue. Um, those are just a little bit of the outdoor views, again, to see some of the architectural flair and the landscaping. The family medicine clinic entry, they have an entry also into the center. Um, to create flow. That door has been locked for two years of COVID, but it'll be open one day soon. Uh, but thank goodness they have their own uh, entry there as well. And Centera is a, our local community hospital. Greenberry signage and a little bit of more of the outdoor spaces. And the Greenberries, again, is critical. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the differences, but I, I, can, I guess I can touch on it some here. Uh, again, Greenberries is a local franchise. They actually have franchises around the world, but it's owned and operated here locally. We deal directly with the owners and the founders. It's been around over 20 years. And I think what's been important about having a Greenberries rather than just the center cafe, um, and we've experienced this countless times. People have driven by who don't know anything about the center. There's a multi-generational soccer uh, facility just up the road from us. Families drive by there and they, they see the center. They don't think it's for them. They see Greenberries and go, oh, Greenberries. That's, that's for me. That's a coffee shop that I can go into. And so people of all ages and families come in and, and that's a really important component. And you can see it does not have its own entrance. You have to enter the center to get to the Greenberries. That was a very mindful design decision to show that Greenberries is not a separate entity. It is part of who we are. And when you walk in, there are no doors inside. It's an open floor plan. There is no door beyond getting in the center to be able to walk in. Um, to be able to enjoy Corey there um, making a coffee for you. Um, that's a view of some people enjoying the outdoor spaces um, from the indoors of the cafe. 
Um, this helps show um, we're a very dog friendly place. Admiral County is, uh, I always joke, I think it's a, a county law that you must have at least one dog um, per household. Most have multiple. It's a very doggy uh, community. And we have a very dog friendly outdoor space. People can bring their dogs indoors as well. Um, people sometimes ask about our dog rules and my running line is it's the same rules it is for you, Jeff and Steve. And they look at me funny. I say, as long as you behave, you're welcome to be here. Um, same with the dogs. If not, we'll ask you to leave. But we, uh, it does create a very family friendly and you see a lot of teenagers and kids in the neighborhood who are bringing their dogs around. Um, and a lot of older adults who don't have dogs anymore like to see that. And then getting indoors, you know, this is the atrium view. The front door is actually to your left. So you would walk in and see that grand staircase. Um, and then one of the things I really love, again, is that two-story atrium. Jeff and his team envisioned that from the very earliest stages. It works extraordinarily well, brings a lot of natural light in. You see the outdoors. It encourages you to go through the building to enjoy the outdoors and the rocking chairs and the cafe tables outside. And while we do have two elevators, I can't tell you how happy I am be, that people use the staircase unless they absolutely cannot. People who have different abilities and need the elevators use it, or if they're carrying art supplies up and things, they use the elevator, but everybody else uses the staircase. So it encourages healthy aging because it's a beautiful staircase. The treads are deeper, the risers are shorter. There's three different levels of handrails. So it's a very age-friendly space. And you can see the gentleman in the middle there, there's a place to stop if you want a little landing space between taking the first flight and the second. So you see some beautiful, uh, um, in the ceiling there, uh, light fixtures, they do provide light, but they also do provide a little bit of a whimsy and fun and softening of the otherwise, you know, kind of hard lines that a building typically has. We do have a, a, a baby uh, grand Steinway 1947 piano donated by a friend. It gets played quite a bit informally and for uh, karaoke time and for jazz trios and a whole lot more. There's, you see our, one of our little trios that plays every Thursday afternoon. They do it for free. They're trying to drum up business for people who need, you know, wedding bands and whatnot. And uh, everybody wins. They, they play beautiful, beautiful music. That's actually obviously, of course, taken from the upstairs. And then a view looking back towards the atrium. And we spend a lot of time in this because this whole space was so critical. We put so much energy in this. A lot of different seating. It's a big open space. It becomes the hub um, of the spoke of the wheel that Jeff talked about for easy uh, wayfinding, which is very important for a senior center. But there's all these different corners in the in the forefront. You see soft seating there. In the bottom right, you see cafe seating. Um, all the way up in the front, you see the green berries and more cafe seating. Um, the welcome desk is in the middle left there. On the far side of that is yet a different site of soft seating. So while it's all connected, you can kind of create your tribe or your little cache or your little space, depending on how you feel and how active you want to be that given day. And then in the upper middle, you see the second floor bridge, which again, creates a sense of openness and yet another social space to hang out. People use that a lot to, if you don't want to be right in the hubbub of the greenberries, but you want to kind of see and be seen, it's a really cool place to hang out, particularly when the music's happening. Again, another view, this and just a little kind of fun thing there off to the left. Those are our bulletin boards and, and flyer racks. We do have digital display screens, but our people very clearly said a lot of us still want paper. Um, and so we wanted to do that. And Jeff constantly and his nice diplomatist, like basically is like in a nice way, said, please don't make us put up ugly institutional elementary school cork boards. So one of the people, our sign company that came in, really worked hard to find these fun different. Uh, whimsical design features to meet a basic senior community center need of giving information uh, in paper there. We have a very active travel program and uh, now it's a very active travel um, space there. It's big enough for three volunteers and our paid travel coordinator. It also becomes kind of a lounge for people to talk about their trips before and afterwards. And we didn't do a lot of travel last uh, in 2020, but it has picked up in 2021 and 22. That gives you a view again of uh, the little lounge outside the uh, travel center. And our auditorium in real life, those lights in the top can be your favorite color, reds and greens. You'll see in a minute a different view. You can see the proper uh, stage up front. 
And that is a big, large drop down screen for PowerPoints, videos. Ultimately, we plan to show more basketball games and things like that, too. Those big gatherings, of course, have not been quite as popular yet in COVID, but we expect them to fully do that. Um, if Jeff didn't mention before, that space seats almost 400 theater style and about 250 banquet style. It does have a proper backstage and green room and bathrooms. Uh, and one of the things when we, um, some of the questions have been around how design aligned with trying to be more age friendly and attract younger audiences. We always wanted to have a performing arts stage and auditorium for the reasons we talked about. But we had talked, we were out you know, early before design really happened. And people would, uh, I remember um, Robert Jospe, Joss, one of the best jazz drummers in the country who's based here in Charlottesville, one was in a meeting once he goes, wait a minute, auditorium, how big is it gonna be? And I said, well, we're thinking 150, 200. He's like, can you make it four or 500? And he helped us understand the need that Jeff mentioned in the community for a four or 500 seat auditorium. We couldn't make it 500, but we made it 400, bigger than our own needs. But what it then becomes is it becomes a site for, this is the Charlottesville Chamber Music Festival, which brings national acts in every fall. They did dress rehearsals in our auditorium to help people do dress rehearsals and have people experience what a dress rehearsal was like. Um, and it brought people of all ages in to come in and experience this because it was a bigger space that we, um, that we normally would have. Um, this is a, a little uh, blue, uh, blues band playing and um, a couple people dancing uh, you know, the, to, to the act. Um, we have food trucks when we have music so that that's kind of a hip ageless thing. And you can see people a variety of ages using the food truck. Uh, that gets to be a, um, a fun, different thing that you don't expect at a center that all ages come to. We rent it out, as Jeff mentioned. You can see the red motif um, for, uh, we have wedding receptions, we have quinceañeras, which also brings a different audience into the center. And you can see all the beautiful natural light there. There's a beautiful art gallery right outside the auditorium. The gentleman in the middle in the blue jeans is one of our most accomplished African-American artists in our region, Frank Walker, who did a show and then talked to people about his art um, that was extraordinarily inspirational. And then moving down the hall to our group uh, exercise studios, um, you can see again, a lot of natural light, proper sprung floors, which allow people to exercise and dance. different view of one of the same group exercise. We actually have two, one that can be divided into two different rooms. So we can have as many as three group X going on at the same time, all of them with mirrors, balance bars, et cetera. The equipped fitness room with a beautiful view out the back, not unimportant. It encourages people to be able to use it. And then upstairs, you can see again, the bridge and the social spaces. Uh, Linda and Gordon hanging out in one of my favorite spaces. That's the landing uh, in the grand staircase and some tours during one of our events, looking out over the back gardens. And you can see the wildlife garden has started to take uh, root out there in the back. That's our administrative space with some flexible um, built offices, but also some flexible spaces. Our volunteer center, and I'm trying to, I'm running through a little bit more because I wanna make sure we get some Q and A. We have two game rooms. Very popular still at the center, but you can see again, that's looking over the atrium. So it connects with the rest of what's happening. When you come in, you can look up and see the, the game room here or the art studio across the way. When you're in those rooms, you can see what's going on um, throughout the center. Much bigger art studio that's been extraordinarily popular. Uh, again, people of all ages using uh, our painting and ceramics and wood carving and a whole lot more. This is what we used to call our lifelong learning lounge um, until we changed that mouthful to simply the, the lounge and the gallery, looking over our library as well, which provides two more social spaces. Again, you see right through the building to these beautiful vistas of the gardens and the woods that are around our property. Honor system lending library, one of our bigger classrooms. You can see the tables are on wheels and chairs are, so you can rearrange the spaces um, in a lot of different ways. Very active neighborhood, multi-use path. You see a lot of people walking, running, bicycling around, which is really nice. The back terrace, the back event lawn. 
this is one, I love this picture. Um, this is one of the types of programs we can do. This is a, a, one of our local wildlife centers that did a raptor show um, and about a hundred people of all ages come. We did it during the summer when kids were out of school. Um, and oh my God, the energy was right out my side of my office. I couldn't go out and enjoy most of it, but I looked out periodically. Um, and it just really brought all kinds of people in for something unexpected. Um, people really loved it. They're gonna come back again in the spring. And that's just, I just love the picture of that bird too. We have croquet and, and all kinds of other fun stuff outside, active and vibrant outdoor recreation spaces that we didn't have in the former building. We do Tai Chi outside. We did a lot more programming outside, particularly on the height of COVID. Um, it's backed off a little bit, but we still do a lot of things outdoors. And then you can see another view of the terrace and how it just becomes a social space of, for people to hang out. A lot of ages, we have multi-generational where people bring their kids, they can play in a safe environment out on the lawn while people drink their coffee or tea. Again, a lot of different seating, uh, cafe seating, rocking seatings, all those, those big chairs in the forefront only weigh about 10 pounds so people can move them around at their own um, like uh, as well. So, I mean, it's a lot, but um, Steve, maybe you can pick a couple of the, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can, one thing I can, before we actually hit, because some of the questions are all around and we've touched on this, but I think, first of all, I want to shout out to Jeff Dreyfus and Bushman Dreyfus Architect. They won the American Institute of Architects Merit Award in Senior Design, um, the most preeminent award for design for this building. So Jeff, again, kudos and thank you for that. And I think some of the things they picked up on that I want to highlight or um, that are relevant to what people asked is, it's a very age-friendly building. We talked about the gallows and the staircase and there's a curbless parking lot and two elevators and a lot of acoustic considerations we've talked about. Um, all of that's built in, but it doesn't feel like a nursing home or a senior center. It's a very ageless place too. And we really plan that. One of my favorite stories around that is the Boys and Girls Club of Charlottesville during the height of COVID were looking for spaces to have learning centers for at home learning for families that couldn't actually learn at home for a variety of reasons. And the, uh, the CEO is about 50 and a bunch of his 30 something lieutenants who were focused on kids came and toured the center in August of 2020. And they're building a new center that Jeff's firm is designing and Barton Mallow is building as we speak. Um, and when one of the lieutenants um, uh, from the Boys and Girls Club realized that after they'd done the tour, they looked at their executive director and said, James, can't we just have them design this building for our Boys and Girls Club? And that to me was the epitome I made my day. I'm like, my God, we have designed a community center for seniors that these Boys and Girls Club people think would be perfect for them. Um, so I think that's an important thing. And also, um, the, uh, the, we talked about the Greenberries, the Centera, but also the design is but aesthetically pretty. I hope you agree, but it's very functional. Many of you, I'm sure, have been in buildings that are not functional. They're beautiful, but not functional, vice versa. So I think Jeff's firm did a great job of balancing that. But Steve, maybe we, you can, what, what kind of, you're looking at? No, we, and yeah, we've got a bunch of good questions and we'll run through these. And then, um, you know, one of the things, folks that are out there, and I know we've got people from other senior centers that are on this call, you know, one thing that I want to reiterate, one of the reasons we want to spotlight this is just to see how when you create something intentionally from the ground up, all the exciting things that can happen. Now, that being said, a lot of us need to operate in old school buildings and don't have a budget of where, uh, where you can do this. And in those situations, what we all know is, is that, hey, just because the walls aren't as pretty, look at what our staff is doing. Look at how innovative we are are here and, and person-centered and all that. And so when we spotlight a beautiful building like that, this that was built from the ground up, we don't want this to, there's another side of the coin of, you know, delivering services and things of that nature, you know, and, and we know a lot of people are doing that unbelievable stuff in outdated buildings, but, but hopefully this provides inspiration because Peter, as you had mentioned, you were in one of those outdated buildings at one point. You were. Um, 
So I think that some of the things I saw in there that I can touch on too, we, we mentioned the lifelong learning space, but I, I brushed by that a little quickly. We actually, I think have seven lifelong learning spaces between calling them lifelong learning or conference rooms. There's one designed for about 12, one for about 20, two for about 40, one for about 50, one for about 75 that can be divided into smaller. So that also creates a lot of space that we can use and we can rent out to community groups. Um, our Lifelong Learning Institute uses them extensively, a lot of other groups too, of all ages, businesses, civic groups, nonprofit boards, and a lot of other folks. Um, and the psychology of space is so important, as many people here I'm sure know, you put 12 people in a room designed for 100 for a bereavement support group, people ain't going to come back. And so that was a very mindful part of it. it, was a lot of room and different spaces and very flexible. Um, we also, we didn't touch on, we are currently primarily still open traditional hours. Um, our vision in a non-COVID world is to be open seven days a week, 12 hours a day. That was the plan April of 2020 that got derailed, but is being picked up. And in the spring, we expect to be three nights and Saturdays. So that's always been part of the way that we look also to be ageless and be open to people in, in traditional work hours or school hours. Um, so doing, we don't do as much intergenerational programming that's often really you know marketed that way it's an intergenerational chess program and that's better than nothing don't get me wrong but what the center design is all about is to create more space and opportunities for people of all ages as one of my friends put it to just to brush up against one another on their terms and let them create the magic we don't plan that schedule we just want to create the environment and I think that's part of what's happening. You know, we do programs like the music, the food truck, the, the wild birds of prey to encourage that. That's going to be interesting to everybody, but we don't force feed it as much. I think that's one of the critical components of what we're aiming to do here. Um, you know, Peter, I'd be interested in your thoughts on reaching and, and I, and there's several questions related to reaching younger, older adults, or, you know, more active older adults, however we want to frame it. This is a challenge that not only senior centers face, but all senior living providers. Any insights on some things other, I mean, outside of having this beautiful, welcoming building, I think the Greenberries is a great way to um, sort of bring in that younger, more active audience. I think the name change was big. We used to just be called the Senior Center and we dropped senior um, before we moved up here. Um, that was a fundamental piece. And it is absolutely, for people who are still wondering or resisting, it is a home run. And it's not just for 50 and 60 year olds, as a few people chatted, it's for 86 year olds who would never be caught dead in a senior center, but they love the center. Um, that barrier was removed. The neighborhood's multi-generational, that's important. Um, our former center ended up all kinds of nursing homes and, and assisted living moved around us. Those things are important resource in our community. Please don't get me wrong. But it became this kind of, we were seen as another nursing home, which is not going to encourage 50 to 60 year olds to come in. Um, the outdoor recreation space has been big. The Greenberries is certainly a big piece. I know not everybody can own a franchise of a local business, but there are businesses out there that are looking for small lease agreements for ready-made traffic that's already coming in. We had four other people interested in a lease agreement. I don't have time to get into why we ended up doing the, 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 uh, uh, the, the franchise owner other than the control was important to us. So those were important. The family medicine clinic was important, not to be geriatric. Um, those things just, they, they right away send a message that this is open to all. Um, mm -hmm. So those I think are some of the key components, of course, along with programming. Um, um, I know we're running up against time, Steve. I just wanna make sure if there's, there's a way that, I guess, first of all, at least making sure our contact information is available. Should I just put yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So folks, and, and if you all don't mind hanging on for just maybe five more minutes, we could probably go through some of these questions. This is recorded, uh, so if, if anybody needs to jump off, we got the recording. And when I post the recording, I'll make sure that I have uh, Jeff and Peter's contact info, as well as um, a lot of other resources. Uh, you know, Bonnie O'Leary has got a lot of questions about auditory, um, and for people of uh, who are hard of hearing, she's wondering, did you have a built-in listening system um in installed when you built this we did and uh, i'll 
try to be quick about it. And in terms of audio uh, accommodation for audio concerns, the a number of options in terms of materials to keep in mind. Obviously, carpet is a very, very good material. The ceilings either dry, uh, they're sound absorptive drywall. There's also, as we know, seal, acoustic ceiling tiles, fabric on chairs and on upholstery make a big difference, something to be considering as you're doing it, and also wall hangings. So it, it's, a, it's a consideration throughout. Um, we do have hearing loops throughout most of the spaces in the building. For cost reasons, we did need to make a few choices where we didn't have it. But in general, somebody walks into the space and if they have the, uh, the hearing aids that accommodate it, they can Im immediately hear what's going on in the room. Great. And then um, Deb Merrimer asks, do you have relationships with nearby senior communities um, and partnerships where they can utilize your services? Absolutely. We work with all the senior living communities who will work with us. And, and many of them do because they, you know, senior living communities market that um, to people like me for your parents, um, that we have everything they need here. Um, and that often is largely true, but they also know that it's not healthy to just stay in the community, that it's best to need to get out in the broader community. So they use the center um, for that. And plus we have critical mass to have a 60 piece band and a tap dance group and a hiking group and travel and yoga and some things that, um, uh, you know, a senior living community may not be able to have because there may not be enough people interested, but those two people want to be in the band we can we can meet that need. So yes, and we can be very flexible in how that happens. We have corporate memberships often for senior living community where anybody who lives there can participate. And they of course bring their their little uh, jaunt buses to the center on a daily basis. And uh, Barbara Sullivan with the Village to Village Network threw in at the end there uh, and the villages. I, I did a quick search and I see there's a Seaville uh, village in Charlottesville, neighbors helping neighbors in their homes and communities. Have you partnered with those folks? We have, our, our village is, is uh, having a hard time getting its foundation under it, um, honestly. But yeah, we work with scores of partners. Um, again, our Lifelong Learning Institute, Senior Statesman of Virginia, um, to bring programs in. That's part of where the all the additional, again, larger art, art space, um, classroom spaces, outdoor spaces that so many other people can use encouraged again to be a community hub. Another short story, I was in a Zoom that it doesn't matter what the group was, but I, everybody's introducing themselves. I mentioned that I was with the Center of Belvin, a guy, he blurted out, he just, he goes, oh my gosh, my child, my children's ballet center just used the center all weekend for all their nutcracker practicing and all these different things. He went on and on about how great it was and how it became this resource they didn't know about. Ah, da, da. So it becomes not just that community hub, but it becomes our public relations that people come in and participate through community partnerships. Great. And, you know, I just glanced down into chat and it said, can you speak to the membership model used by the center? Um, yeah, so we, um, again, we're a nonprofit. We get no government funding for operations. Our city and county did invest um, to help build the building, but we operate primarily with philanthropy. Um, but we've always had a membership model since 1960 when dues were 25 cents a month. Um, they're a little more expensive now. They're now $180 a year for an individual basic membership and $480 for what we call a prime membership. The prime gets you access to the fitness room, all the group exercise programs. Some of the group X are free, but some have a fee um, unless you're a prime member. The band uh, is extra because we have to pay an instructor. Um, so you get a lot more as a prime member. Importantly, we also have an honor system scholarship. Anybody who says that's a barrier for me, you fill out a form and we have people who underwrite those, the scholarship costs. Um, and there's a 10% uh, discount for households. So whatever, 180 times two minus 10% for two people at the same address for a basic membership. Okay, great. And then uh, I'm trying to get all these things here, but Cheryl Bartholomew is from Montana. And I think she is uh, on this call because she's got a project in her community, but she was asking a little bit about the storage space for like fitness equipment and HVAC. I, I know you could get in the weeds on this, Jeff, but uh, 
maybe speak about that and how you build that into design. I can see where sometimes those things are forgotten. Forgotten and also potentially squeezed as budget concerns come into play. Uh, one of the things that was critical to the board of directors throughout this process was air quality throughout the building. So the mechanical system was not the least expensive mechanical system we could have put into the building. Um, it required space and it required money, but it was, as Peter pointed out, there were design principles from the start that the board adopted and, and air quality was one of the primary ones. So we always had to be mindful of and respectful of the needs of the mechanical engineers and the equipment that it required. So throughout the planning process, if you don't, it, it, it's the same with the, the programming and the space allocation for storage. Uh, a very lengthy process be before we began design included programming the entire building and asking questions about every single space that we were designing and the storage requirements for each. So making sure that you account for it in the beginning and that you honor those needs throughout the design process is, is important. Great, and I'm gonna throw the brakes on things after these two questions, but again, thanks to the audience for your engagement. Thanks to Jeff and, and Peter for sharing this information. It's very inspirational, but um, the uh, let's talk about transportation a little bit. Uh, any sort of creative things that you've done there, we deal with so many older adults that getting them out of the house can be a challenge uh, because in a car dependent place like uh, Charlottesville, are, are there some resources to get uh, folks to the center? Yeah, we don't do any of our own, but the design again was critical. The, the drop off area is covered, it's large. So even if the jaunt, which is an independent nonprofit that provides older adult and different ability transportation um, and comes by our door all the time, uh, the, the drop off area first is curbless it's covered and it's large. So even if we have three or four jaunt and senior living communities and me dropping my mother off or whatever it may be, there's room for a lot of cars that to be queued up so they feel safe, they don't feel rushed, they're not being rained on on a day like today. That was a really critical piece because that's how a lot of people get to the building. Um, curbless parking, plenty of handicapped parking. There's actually sidewalks, if we didn't talk or note in the, in the parking lot. So it's a pedestrian friendly. So the variety of ways people get there, we were very mindful of that, first of all. Um, the uh, Charlottesville Almoral is working on its transit problems because we do have a, a large problem here for older adults, particularly. Um, and Almoral County just yesterday approved pilot studies for on-demand services that you don't have to reserve 24 hours in advance like a lot of senior transit. So it's an Uber type of model, but publicly funded, so affordable. Um, and the center has been paying a lot of attention to transit. It's in our strategic plan and our equity action plan because it is an equity issue too. Um, there was two scenarios. One was just north of the river. The second was actually reaching it all the way down to Rio Road and Belvedere and the neighborhoods around. And I spent not an insignificant amount of time um, advocating and getting other people to advocate, you better do scenario two, which is what they've approved. So we are at the table a lot with the Regional Transit Partnership. I'm on our local community advisory committee, um, uh, our Charlottesville Area Alliance. I head our transit work group, all to make sure we're helping to make things happen in transit, not just for the center, but seniors generally in our community. Um, and we're looking at some more things too, but I won't go further since we are. That's awesome. Here. All right, so we'll close. This is great. And I threw GoGo -Go grandparents into the chat, folks, if uh, it's sort of an Uber Lyft type na nationwide program that a lot of people aren't familiar with. But the um, um, last question here, you know, we so many times when we're talking about uh, senior centers, everybody's trying to get the young, active senior into their senior centers. But Gloria brings up a great um topic is have the concern for less active seniors been addressed everyone age in place and may not be as active how do they fit in and i think jeff your design is is brilliant that's probably the first way that we make things welcoming to people of all abilities no matter what their age is but any other thoughts on encouraging less active uh, uh individuals to come by go ahead jeff i well Ease of access is, is key. 
And as Peter pointed out, we, we didn't really talk about, we could, we could have a probably an hour long discussion about the design of the parking lot and access to the building, but making sure that when someone gets out of their car, they are not crossing a drive aisle to, in order to get to the building. So we spent a lot of time working on the fact that somebody can get out of their car or be dropped off. They don't have to step up to a curb. They don't have to step into a drive aisle to get to the building. So beyond universal design, I think it's also a matter of providing people exciting active spaces to sit in, even if they're not active, to be, to, to as Peter pointed out, the bridge is a great spot. Take the elevator up, you sit there, you can read a book and watch the world go by. So that, that even though you may not want to actively engage with people, you are part of a vibrant community, someplace to go and know that, that there are people there that you can interact with when and as you wish without having to be active. Yeah, I this think is, that, that is, we, we did take into consideration a lot. And thank you for bringing that up because it it, uh, it does appear to be something that, it, you know, I had somebody the other day said it looks like a country club, which is is nice to hear. There's that quality, but and it's an affordable country club. But, um, you know, Jeff mentioned the, um, those are floor considerations. Um, a lot of the, uh, the the travel lanes are, and Jeff, I will use the wrong term, poured concrete. Yes. Well, um, at, which is senior friendly. I mean, you can wheel on it easily. If you shuffle, you can do on it easily. If you have depth perception issues, you don't have to worry about a complicated carpet design. Um, that was a, a big issue um, that we picked. Um, when we do have carpets, it's obviously very low ply. There are um, six companion restrooms throughout the building. Um, six or eight? There's eight. eight. There's, there's two in each quadrant, in each left, right, upstairs, up, downstairs, so that um, older adults who need more time or need assistance in a restroom have a ready-made access. There are restrooms in all over the building, so you don't have to get far. They're easy to find. Um, uh, you know, again, all the drop-off areas, accessibility, the hearing loops, um, the sight issues that were taken into account, a lot of natural light helping, um, all that was heavily taken into account. And we do a lot of programs such as chair yoga and, and a lot of games. We, we play bingo, we do crafts, we play bridge. We don't promote those as much because people expect that. And that's not what's different about the center, but we still do all those things. Yeah. We do travel that's very straightforward. We do travel to Iceland, but we do travel um, to go bet at the Charlestown races too. Um, and dinner theater. So I we still it. try to reach the gamut of what people's skills and interests are. I love it. This is great. I thank you for hanging on for a little bit longer to get through this, but you did a great job of giving us inspiration on the way things can be. And I'll share your contact information. And I hope that we begin to see all across the country similar approaches, borrowing all or some of the uh, the ingredients that you put together in this amazing project. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for everybody. And I'm, I'm glad to see so many people stick around that it's been useful to folks. Um, I can't encourage enough people to follow up with me. Um, email's the best, even if it's to schedule a phone call. But one of the biggest things I kind of glossed over of how we've accomplished this is I visited and talked to scores of senior center experts around the country. I took advantage of visiting when I was speaking at conferences. My wife humored me all the way to Seward, Alaska. I visited senior centers. We were there on vacation. Albuquerque, St. Petersburg, Orlando, Cape Cod, all over. We would go and visit places. We did in, um, outside of uh, uh, the Smoky Mountains in August. We visited two senior centers, um, one in Asheville. And I always learned something from every one of them. And we lean on a lot of people. That's how we learned and how we did things better. Um, I could fill another hour and a half of that. Um, so please, I, I, I have taken from our field and I wanna give back to our field. I have conversations going on with tons of people. So please don't hesitate. If there's questions that weren't asked, you want follow up or a Zoom or a phone, anything at all, I, I can't emphasize it enough. I'd be happy to help. I'd, I'd like to offer the same. And, and thank you, Steve, for the opportunity. I'd also like to say, we, we understand that this is a bit of a rarefied situation um, and that as an architect, I don't mean to imply that a new facility is required in order to reach the, the, the number of people and the types of people and that, that offer the types of services that are being offered at the center. Renovation is, is absolutely something that, that 
is it's just part of our world. And this does not, I don't mean to imply that you need a new facility in order to reach beyond what the preconceptions are of a, of a senior center. There are opportunities every step of the way, no matter what your facility. And I just think past the stereotypes is all I can say. And, and I'm happy to talk with anyone that might want to talk further about those opportunities and, and the challenges that they may face. I love it. All right. Folks, uh, we will see you at the next one, and I'll make sure to get this recording up shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.